All right, let's uh, remain standing, Luke chapter 14. By the way, that's a great song for what we're about to study today, the requirements of discipleship from the Lord. Luke chapter 14, today, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, Jesus speaking to the multitudes following him, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother, Brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow, there you go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for telling us the truth, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for telling us your requirements for discipleship. And Lord, you've called the church to make disciples of all the nations. And this is the standard as well as other standards we'll see that apply to discipleship. And so, Lord, we just want to surrender ourselves to you. We're just saying, I surrender all. Lord, we, we do want that. We need the help and the wisdom and the power of your spirit to do it, but that's what we desire, and it's because of the work of your spirit in our lives. And so, Lord, we give this service to you. We give our lives to you, and we ask for that work of your spirit in this room at this very moment. And Lord, don't just bless this room, but wherever your church gathers in Oakdale today, bless your church. And thank you for wanting to do that. We thank you and praise you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So as we continue our, our journey through the in-depth study of the life and ministry of Jesus in chronological order, we find ourselves here today and we will begin to see a bit, well, we see it all the time, the incredible wisdom of the Lord. I love the progression in Scripture, how the Lord has put Scripture together. And I say that because last week, we really studied, the entire study was about how to be saved. And the, the Lord Jesus responded to a man who made a comment about, uh, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And truly, that's a blessed person, a person that's given their lives to Christ and believed in him as Lord and Savior. That's a blessed person to know one day I'll be enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I believe Jesus responded to that uh, true statement by talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, this future feast that all believers will get to experience. And I believe in the analogy, the man or the master was God the Father who prepared the feast for Jesus, his son, for what he did for us. And then it's the Holy Spirit in, uh, representing the servant who invites people into a relationship with the Lord. And then the Lord, even in his wisdom, gave kind of three different types of people and how different people respond to this amazing invitation to salvation. And fortunately, there's the religious type, like the religious leaders. And they think that they can be good on their own and keep the law of Moses or keep whatever or get to heaven based on being a good person. Nobody meets that requirement. So that group who's invited is not going to enjoy this bread, this feast with the Lord. And the Lord made that very clear. Those who are invited will not enjoy this meal, this bread. And that, then I think the second group was the general Jewish people, and many of them were believing in the Lord. And then I believe the third group was the entire Gentile world, and many of them are enjoying a relationship, uh, myself today included. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and for what you have done. So that whole message last week was about being saved. But today, Jesus goes to a different subject matter, and that is the matter of discipleship. And today, we're going to talk about Jesus' statements, Jesus' requirements of being a disciple. And we need to know as a church, and, and if you're a believer, you're the church, but we as the church are called to be disciples. We're called to make disciples, not just converts, we're called to make disciples, those that are thoroughly committed to the things of the Lord. Once a person is saved, the Holy Spirit is then calling them into this life of discipleship. And so that's what we're going to look at today. What is it that is required to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus? And so we're going to dig into some interesting subject matters today. But I want to make a contrast between the requirements to be saved and the requirements to be a disciple. And at the end, we'll kind of make some connections here for us, because uh, there's an age-old debate, you may not know it, the age-old debate is, is every believer a disciple? And I'll attempt to answer that uh, right before we get done today, but first, I want to put up an overhead, and we're going to go through three overhead slides today, but the first thing we're going to do is let's define what it is for the requirement to be saved, separate from the requirements to be disciples, because today's passage is about the requirements to be a disciple. 
So with the first overhead slide here, number one, I want us to notice here, there we go, um, this is the requirements to be saved. And the first uh, scripture up there is John chapter 1, verse 12, and we read, but as many as received him, that is received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, here it is, to those who believe in his name. All it takes to be a believer is to believe in Jesus' name. Now, we kind of think that's a little weird. What do you mean? I thought we had to believe in him. What do you mean believe in his name? Well, in the ancient day and in the things of Scripture, when you talk about somebody's name, it's literally everything about them. It's who they are. It's what they stand for. It's what they've done. So to believe in Jesus and who he is and what he has done, that's what it means to believe in his name, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Savior of the world that he's the only one who ever lived a perfect life and then went to the cross and died to pay for our sins. He's the only one who ever raised himself from the dead, proving as power over death. So that's the, that's the one we're believing in. And anyone that has believed in Jesus, they are saved. You are saved. You are a believer. The next verse, John three sixteen, I think the most well-known verse in scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, anyone can, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But the simple requirement, believes in him. All a person has to do is believe in Jesus, truly trust him as Lord and Savior. In the very same chapter, John 3, 36, Jesus said, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son does not have life and shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. There Jesus covered the affirmative and the negative. Believe in me, you have life. Don't believe in me, you don't have life. It's that simple. So once again, the only requirement to be saved is to believe in Jesus. John 6, 47, Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Are you seeing a pattern here? You just gotta believe in Jesus. That's all it is. You have to really believe. You have to believe you are a sinner, you're not perfect. You're going to die for your sins unless you believe in him, the one who died to pay for your sins. Slide number two. I just want to give a couple more verses. In Acts 16, when Paul was in jail and the Philippian jailer was there, we read, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they, that's Paul and others, said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And that's not saying the household saved because the father was, but the father's supposed to come to Christ and believe in him and then tell his children they need to believe in Jesus and then the whole household will be saved. But again, believing in Jesus. Now, this believing is faith. And the next one is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's it. The believing in him is a faith thing. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not, as, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we have to believe in him by faith. We have to truly trust in Jesus. And then finally, in 1 John chapter 5, we read, this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. It's not in anyone else. It's not in anyone else. And he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Here it is. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you believe in Jesus today, you're saved. You're saved, you're a Christian, you're saved for eternity, you're gonna be with the Lord and enjoy this marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the requirement to be saved. So very simple, very clear requirements. But today we're gonna to see a different standard given by Jesus, a higher bar, if you will, when it comes to discipleship. And you may think, well, that's interesting. Well, why didn't he just put it all together? No, he just needs us to know we're sinners and need a Savior. And once we believe in him, then his Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And now we're called to a greater life, a life of discipleship. And now this is why we're going to see a different standard from the Lord. And today, now what we're going to look at is the requirements of discipleship. Now, let's notice here in our first verse that great multitudes went with him. And I'm, I'm thrilled whenever I see one person comes after Jesus, let alone a multitude, and then I'm even more thrilled that great multitudes. <clears throat> Don't you ever wonder, you ever try to picture in your mind the scene? How many people were coming after him and clamoring to get through to him? What's well, thrilling to see that after talking about salvation, many people, great multitudes, were following after him. They wanted to know more. And for that person that follows him, he'll give you more. And so he turned and said to them. 
He's speaking to people that want to follow him. They want to come after him. <clears throat> now, clearly, some may have believed in him, and some wouldn't have, I have to imagine, in this great multitude of people. But Jesus is now going to lay down the requirements of a disciple. And this is truly what we're called to. And this is the greatest life to be lived. The life of a disciple is the blessed life. It truly is. You want to be blessed today? Live like a disciple. I just guarantee it. That's the life that's free of guilt and shame and many other things. Do we want that kind of a life? Well, the Lord Jesus is going to tell us what's required for this kind of a life. What we're going to cover here in verses uh, 26 down to verse 33 is I'm going to uh, lay out four requirements Jesus lays out here of a disciple. And then I'm going to add three more requirements from other passages I don't believe are covered here. So when we look at all of what Jesus called us to, I see about seven requirements of a disciple. So that's what we're going to dig into. So if we could put up the third overhead slide, that would be great. So beginning in verse 26, requirement number one for a disciple, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now I'm going to break this first verse into two requirements. The first one you can see on the overhead is, if anyone comes after me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. And then we'll end it, and then we'll separately cover, and if anyone comes after me and does not hate his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Those are two different things. So I'm going to cover them as requirements number one and number two. But first, the first one is the Lord tells you you're supposed to hate your mother, father, wife, children, brothers, and sisters to follow him and be a disciple. Now, do you feel stumped on that one? I mean, really, honestly. Does that make sense with the Jesus you know? The Jesus has called us to love everyone? Is that not what he calls us to? And it can almost seem like, I mean, no disrespect, I'm just saying, you can is the Lord confused? Of course he's not. If ever we're confused, it's us, it's not him. He's exactly clear on what he's asking. So you can look at this and say, wait a second, Jesus, you're calling me to hate my mother, my father, my wife, my children, my brothers, and my sisters. That doesn't make sense to me. So I must be missing something. So let's try to find that missing something. First off, we clearly know the Lord Jesus has called us to love everyone. That is clear. He clearly tells us to love everyone. And let me give some examples. And this is all because God is love. The Bible doesn't just say God has love. It says he is love. It's his nature. But for example, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Isn't it easy to love people that love you? That's easy, isn't it? How do we do with our enemies? Then a little couple verses later in Luke 6, but love your enemies and do good to those to, and, and, and do good and lend and helping, uh, uh, hoping that for nothing in return, for great is your, uh, for your reward will be, will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High. In John 15, Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another. As I have loved you, greater love has no man than this than he lay down his life for his friends, or to love all people. By the way, to, to hate your wife there, did you, guys, did you like that one? Don't, don't like that one. You go, that again seems at odds. Because in Ephesians 5, the Lord tells men three times to love your wife. Now men, let's, let's, let's admit it, we're a little dense, right? The Lord had to say it three times in one passage, because we miss it. We're to love our wives. So what gives? What gives? And what we realize in scripture is what he's really talking about is your love for me needs to be so much greater than your love for your family and friends and wife and children, brother, sisters, mother, father, that by comparison, it's hate. And I think the clarity for us on this issue comes from Jesus making a similar statement in Matthew 10. Let me read that one. And I think it'll kind of begin to crystallize. Jesus said in Matthew 10, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. See, it's a, it's a comparison thing. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So what he's saying is, relatively speaking, your love for me is called to be greater to the degree that if you compare your love for your family, that you love me and hate them. 
He's not actually calling us to hate our family members. So we need to know that. And let's face it, it's amazing because I hope you really, really, really love your family. But we're actually called to a greater love for the Lord. And that love only comes from once the Holy Spirit lives in us and gives us the ability to love. That is the fruit of the Spirit. And so as a disciple, we're called to make the Lord number one in our lives above our family. And you may say, Why, what's the big deal? Why would the Lord say that? Well, it's very simple. We may not experience it in this world, but there are some parts of the world today, you have to reject your family's advice to follow the Lord. You have to. Because in some parts of the world today, somebody's gonna give their life to the Lord Jesus and trust in him, and they're gonna be completely, thoroughly disowned by their family. That's just to be saved, of course. Now we actually have the power of the Holy Spirit to truly have this comparable uh, thing to really love the Lord more than my family. But first I need to say, you know what, Lord? I love you, I wanna be saved by you. And now he gives us the power to choose him over our family the rest of our lives and not cave and go back. So there it is. Do we love the Lord more than our family? Do we? That's a big deal. There are times family will call you, hey, you know, I know you love the Lord Jesus, but you're taking a little overboard there, aren't you? I mean, really? You're really gonna begin to make every decision in your life based on what he wants? Yes, I am, and you should too. I'm not the crazy one. Well, don't tell them that. It implies they're crazy. It's a thrill to make sure the Lord is number one in your life. It's such a thrill. Compared to anyone else in this world, he's all that matters. So he gets to be the Lord of everything. So we need to love him more than someone else. By the way, the next one's the hard one. If you think the hating your family compared to Jesus, here's the problem, I think in my mind. If anyone comes to me and, and does not hate his own life also, requirement number two, he cannot be my disciple. Now let's face it, this is the hard one, isn't it? Because if you're honest with yourself, you are head over heels in love with yourself. Have you ever admitted that? Is it not crazy that the world's running around telling us we need to learn to love ourselves? You probably know this, even within the body of Christ, there's this lie that the Lord tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, and I can't do that until I learn to love myself. And the Lord says, no, nope, that is completely, completely wrong. In fact, in Ephesians 5, the Lord very specifically said, no one ever hated his own flesh. That is a lie if you bought the lie that you don't love yourself, Love for self is the problem in this world. All the wars in this world ultimately came from somebody loving themselves more than everyone else, and I decided I want that, and I'm just gonna take it from you because I love myself. Now, a very easy way to prove how much we love ourselves is this. Imagine if we were to take a picture of you with 100 people, and we posted a big poster out here with that 100 people, and what if you looked at that picture? By the way, first, who do you look for first? You know who you look for. You know you look for yourself first. You know the other 99 people could have taken the greatest picture they'll ever take in their lives, but if your picture's not good, it's a lousy picture. <laughs> and you want to burn it, don't you? Oh, we need to get them all together and retake that, because my picture was lousy. You know you love yourself. That's our problem. Temptations, whenever we're tempted, why is it I'm so tempted? Because I love myself and I love my flesh. I love what I love. And that's all there is to it. We love ourselves. So to, to really begin to hate my own life, that's what I'm called to do. By comparison, when I'm tempted to sin, I'm supposed to say, I love Jesus so much I hate my life. I hate my decisions. I hate my choices. That is the blessed life. I'm telling you it's the blessed life because I just tend to make horrible decisions. So I'm supposed to hate my life, and I ask, how are we doing on that one? How are we doing on requirement number two, hating my own life compared to Jesus? Well, requirement number three in verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus said to be a disciple, you're not just supposed to hate family next to me, not just hate your life compared to me, now you have to bear your cross and come after him. What does it mean to bear your cross? Well, it's very simple. We really don't understand this in our culture, but in the time of Jesus' day, and the Roman culture, they knew what it meant to bear your cross. 
And the simple reason is the Romans were very, very, very good at what we call a deterrent to crime. You know why? They would crucify people right by the side of the road. They tended to crucify them right by the side of a main thoroughfare so that when the family's traveling along, little Johnny is in whatever, in his little buggy or whatever, and, he, and he's in this thing in the wagon, he's looking up and go, Daddy, why are they on that cross? Well, they did something that offended Rome or some law. Well, I don't want to end up there. That's right, that's a deterrent. And Jesus actually tells us to come along and says, you need to do that to yourself willingly. It is not exactly my first thought in the morning to wake up and say, boy, I just really want to kill myself today. But that's exactly what he's called us to. And it is a brutal, brutal death he's talking about. A death so severe there will be no response from the flesh left. That's what he's called us to. And by the way, in one of the other scriptures, Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you must take up your cross daily. Luke 9 then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. And the reason you need to do it daily is because every day your, fresh, your flesh wakes up raring to go. And you have to kill it again. I mean, if cats have nine lives, I've got way more than that in my flesh. But that's the thing. We're supposed to wake up each day and kill it. See, the problem each day is my soul, where I do all my thinking and I have all my emotions and my decision making, every day I've got a battle going on. I've got a civil war going in my mind because my body is at war with the spirit of God in me. And one of them is going to win today. So I need to kill the flesh so that I'm listening to the spirit. And that's what discipleship looks like, is killing the flesh so I'm only listening to the spirit. So I need to kill it. I need to kill it. So there it is, the first three requirements. I need to hate my family compared to Jesus. I need to hate my life compared to my love for Jesus. And I'm to die to myself every day. And the better I do at that, the more blessed my life will be. I'm just telling you, the more blessed your life will be. And greater will your, will your reward be in heaven. Well, Jesus is going to take a couple of verses now. And he's going to give a couple of analogies. He wants to drive home this point before we get the fourth requirement down in verse uh, 30, uh, 33. He's going to give a couple of images. And, and, and I love what he does because what he really is going to say is, hey, by the way, this cost of discipleship, I recognize this is a high bar I'm calling you to by the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I'm calling you to a high bar of discipleship. So I want you to count that cost. Are you willing to pay it? Because you will be if the Holy Spirit lives in you. At least there will be some desire. That's the proof of him living in you. So here's what Jesus says. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? It's a very simple analogy. If you're a builder, you want to build a building. As a church, we bought land on the edge of town. We'd love to build a building. And we have roughly counted the cost. I can tell you roughly what I think it would take to build that. And I know very well we do not have enough money yet. And I think how foolish we would look if we were to jump in too early. Of course, I don't think anybody would be dumb enough to give us a loan if we're not ready or have enough cash reserves. But we're waiting on the Lord for all that. But you need to count that cost. And if we don't, here's the ramifications. Jesus said, verse 29, lest... After he has laid the foundation, number one, he realizes he is not able to finish, and guess what happens? All who see it will begin to mock. And I would almost say rightly so. Look at that fool. I mean, did he not do any financial analysis before entering into that decision? Did he not in any way decide, hey, I, I can't afford that, or, or I'm not willing to pay that price to build that? And in this case, we're talking about building a life, a life of discipleship. And we would look foolish. As a church, we would look foolish. And I don't want to give any room to the enemy to mock us. And let's face it, when Christians don't make this decision to ultimate discipleship or do a bad job of it, I should say, there's almost a level of mocking, isn't there? There, there's an element when once a person that you work with knows that you're a believer, they're watching you, and I think it's a good thing and they're saying, are they living up to what they are preaching? In other words, what they're asking, whether they know it or not, have they risen 
to the fullness of the call to discipleship God has in their lives now that they're saved? Or does it look like a hypocritical life? So they would begin to mock. Jesus even says what they would say in their mocking. Verse 30, this man began to build and he's not able to finish. What a fool. That's my ad. It's not in scripture. So there it is. Well, he wants to give another analogy in case that one didn't sink in for you. Maybe you're not a financial person. Think like a king. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider, okay, I have 10,000 soldiers, I have 10,000, whether I'm able to go with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Now, unless you're Alexander the Great and an incredibly great genius strategist, you may not be able to beat 20,000 with only 10,000. So the average person would likely say, oh, I better, I better look for peace terms. I can't win this battle. That's just wisdom. And that's why he says, or else while the uh, rather is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks for conditions of peace. I can't do it. By the way, the beauty of it is, as a Christian, for you to say, I can't do it, that's actually right. In and of myself, I can't do it. But now that I'm saved, I have the Holy Spirit living in me. Now I can rise to the occasion. I can overcome. I can win. I can be a disciple because I have all I need by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have all we need. If we just humbly admit, I can't do this life, Lord. You fill me with your spirit every day. I can be that disciple you've called me to be. And so there it is. Jesus lays out these two analogies. And so I ask, how are we doing? Have we counted the cost? You may think, I never really thought in these kind of terms. I never really thought in these terms. And maybe I've given up. I've given up. Have I done that? Have I given up? I've just even stopped even attempting to be a disciple. I just can't pay it. I'm not willing to pay it. Well, that would be at odds of what the Holy Spirit's trying to do in our hearts as he's called every Christian to be a disciple. He's called us all to discipleship. Are we doing it? Are we submitted to him or are we surrendered to him in this call of discipleship? So he gave those two analogies. Well, let's move on to the next one. And of course, we can go to the next slide because now overhead, uh, uh, the overhead number two, the requirement number four, we get in verse 33. So likewise, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be not my disciple. So we've already seen we're to hate all of our family next to Jesus. I'm to hate my own life next to Jesus. And then he told us the third one was to take up your cross and die to yourself. And now he says, you have to forsake all, all that we have. Have we done that? And let's face it, we live in a culture where we have a lot. We have many things. Now, that does not necessarily mean he's telling you to go sell it all, because we did see him go to some people and say, sell all that you have and give it away to the poor and come follow me. But are we really willing to give it all up? Are we really willing to forsake all? That is what he calls, that's his requirement. And, and, and I'm not gonna lower that just to make it comfortable. That's the call to discipleship. Am I willing to forsake everything and we really do need to be in that place and we can sometimes ask ourselves, but not really, no. If he came to me today and said, I need you to sell everything, give it all away and come follow me and go to wherever, would I do it? That's the true test of a disciple. Would I do it? Now, I, I say all this today. I don't say this like I've got it down. We're in this together, right? I need you to pray for me and I'm praying for you. Because the blessed life is the life of a disciple. And we're all growing this. Nobody's got this whooped. Nobody's got it down. Only one has it down, that's Jesus. He lived the perfect life of a disciple, if you will. Of course, we're disciples after him. but He's the, he's the master. But he did everything perfectly. We could call him a disciple of the Father. He did only what the Father called him to do. He never once did what was best for, what, best for him, his flesh. He only did what was the will of the Father. This is what we're called to do. So there you go. Well, that's requirement number four. Let me now add, if, if I can, and uh, I've got the verse up there. You can turn there if you want to, but you don't need to. The requirement number five is in John 8. Jesus said to, to the Jews who believed in him, who believed him. Uh, that verse is interesting. He's talking to believers. They're already believers. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. 
So it clearly implies the requirement of discipleship is you abide in his word. And the word abide literally means that you live there and are comfortable there. You've made yourself at home. And I ask, dear Christian, have we made ourselves at home in the word of God that I know it? I'm comfortable with it. I live there. I uh, do everything I can by the power of the spirit to keep it. I'm living there. Could we almost say I, I, kind, of, I, I kind of abide in the word as though it's some place I visit? Or do I live there? There's a difference between visiting and abiding. Am I abiding in the word of God? One of the greatest moments in my mind in a Christian's life is that moment when the light bulb goes on and they say, hey, that, that, that word of God, that word of God that we're given, G- the Lord is serious about obedience to it. That's a great moment. That's the moment I really begin, we really begin to abide in his word because I take it seriously. I really can build my entire life upon these words. And so are we there? Are we living by the word of God? Or are we deceiving ourselves? Over the years, I've known, sadly, some people who can quote scripture like you can't believe, but they're not doing any of it. And that's just the ultimate self-deception. Am I deceiving myself? Do I read the word of God, but I don't abide in it? Do I read it, but not apply it? That's what it is to be a disciple, is I believe it, I live it. And the last two requirements today from John chapter 15, verses seven to eight, and there we read, if you abide in me, Jesus said this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and there's a bunch of blessings, you will ask what you desire, it should be done for you, and by this my Father is glorified and you will bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So there's two requirements there. The first requirement is if we abide in Jesus. Now it's interesting because the prior requirement was we need to abide in the word. Now separately Jesus said we need to abide in him. See we get to wake up each day and really live in his word and live in him. What he wants for me. And see, if you go to work and you have a good manager, you should go to them each day, unless it's very clear what you need to do that day, and say, what do you want me to do today? I, I want to just completely obey you and follow you. What do you have for me? And that's to abide in him. Are we abiding in Jesus? But he also adds that, and my word abides in you. Now, I find this interesting because if you look at that, that seventh requirement is kind of the opposite direction of requirement five. We're to abide in his word, and now Jesus says, and my word is supposed to abide in me. So I'm supposed to live in the word, but he's actually saying now his word has to be able to make itself at home in me. Have I given it that place? Have I given the word of God a place of life and living and residence and complete ownership of my life? Have I given his word that place? That's the seventh requirement. Now, I love this one because Jesus laid out I believe, four blessings for the person that will do these things, that will abide in Jesus and let his word abide in me. And blessing number one, he said there is that person will ask for great things from the Lord and they'll be granted. See, the beauty of, the, of, of being a Christian is if I pray in accordance with God's will, he'll always say yes and he'll always answer that prayer in the affirmative. Well, what's the best way to know I'm praying in accordance with his will is to be a disciple. And, let, and abide in him and let his word abide in me and abide in his word and all that. If I'm doing all that, I'll tend to ask for what he wants and I'll get those prayers answered. So the better a, a job I do as a, as a disciple by the power of the Holy Spirit, the more he'll answer my prayers. Secondly, he said that person will glorify the Father. And whether we know it or not, that is our primary goal in life is to bring glory to the Father. Every day we're to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That word hallowed means to bring him glory. You're here to bring him glory. We're here to give him all the credit, all the glory. He deserves it all. And so as you live as a disciple, just by living your life, you'll glorify him. That's a blessing. Thirdly, he says that person will bear much fruit. The more I live like a disciple, the more fruit I'll bury. See, Jesus gave a scenario in the parable of the soils that uh, there are some disciples that bear 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. If you want to bear like that, you need to be a disciple. It's interesting today, I ask you, do you feel like you're a disciple and you're bearing one-fold? Not 30, not 60, not 100? You may feel like I'm bearing 0.5% fruit, whatever. 
He wants us to bear some 30, some 60, some 100. And by the way, even if you're at 30-fold, he wants you to grow into 60 and then 100. And the more we do this, and as we grow in this discipleship, we'll begin to bear more and more fruit. And of course, the final blessing is the whole issue we're talking about itself. If you do these things, you'll be his disciple. You'll be his disciple the more we do this. So there it is. There's the requirements of a disciple. It is quite the high bar Jesus gives. And before we close, and then I'll make some very important closing comments in a minute, what I, I really find it interesting what Jesus does here. He actually talks about us being salt. Salt. Do you not know we're, we're supposed to be the salt and light of the earth as Christians? And notice what he says, basically, if you don't take a serious stab at by the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to be a disciple, you'll be like salt that lost, that's lost its flavor. And notice what he says. Salt is good, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears, let him hear. He's saying, please listen to me. If you don't take this discipleship seriously, you'll be like worthless salt. And when we're in Matthew chapter 5, we talked about what salt does. Salt adds flavor. Salt creates and enhances thirst. Salt preserves things. Salt promotes healing. And salt demonstrates value. God wants all of those things coming out of our lives on his behalf as disciples. And if we're not doing that, we won't be adding flavor to life for other people to be thirsty. We won't be enhancing thirst. We won't be preserving things. We won't be promoting healing in other people's lives and we won't be demonstrating the value of this relationship we have with the Lord. Are we doing this? I don't want our lives to be worthless. I want them to be incredibly, incredibly valuable for the things of the Lord and for us to bring the Lord, the Lord great glory. As I close today, I'll give one simple application today, but here's an age-old debate. There's an age-old debate in Christianity. Is every believer a disciple? It's, it's a serious debate. And I literally almost vacillate between the two. I can tell you today where I currently am. We get to heaven, he'll explain it all to me. I get that better brain that we're all going to get. But number one, I want to say that some say all believers are disciples. Some say they're not. I will say this. It is unequivocally clear that if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's called you into discipleship. That is unequivocally clear. The moment, you, before you were saved, you just knew the Holy Spirit convicted me, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus, and I finally submitted to that. But now he's come to live in me, and now I have the power to be a disciple. That power to do that only comes once I'm saved. But now he's calling me into discipleship. Have I submitted to that calling? And, and, and there's the issue. I would say every Christian is somewhat of a disciple. We just may be very bad at it. I'll put it this way. If we're truly saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you and he's been calling you to discipleship your entire Christian life. And to not respond to that at all, to me would indicate you're not saved in the first place. You're not listening. So I argue that every believer is a disciple. You just may be bearing practically no fruit. No fruit. So never in saying this is this to make someone doubt their salvation. But if anybody were to come into my office and say, you know what? I don't bear any fruit. Once I had a man in my office and we were talking about sin and he was struggling with this sin and I said, you know, in your moments of strength, I think we all, I hope you know what that means. When, isn't it, don't you have times where whatever your struggle to sin is in life, in that area of your life, that you have moments of strength where you're like, I'm never going to do that again. You think you're invincible. I'm never going to sin like that again because you just feel like you're filled with the Spirit. I said, in those moments, do you want to stop your sin? And he said, I don't think so. Yikes. I said, we need to talk about your salvation. It's not possible to know the Lord and have no desire to do the right thing because the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and he's calling you to discipleship. And in the same way, if I'm bearing zero fruit as a disciple, if I have no conviction today in looking at these seven requirements, no convictions, I'd say you need the Lord. 
And once you know him, then the Holy Spirit will be immediately calling you to this greater, greater Christian life. So that's where I stand. I'd say every believer is a disciple. We'd just be maybe very bad at it. But this is why he's given us the church. So you come to church and we edify one another. We exhort one another. We challenge one another. He's called you to great discipleship. That's how we make disciples. He's teaching us how do I do this thing. And the most important thing to do this is we completely rely on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to do this. One of the great mistakes of a message like this today would be to walk out here saying, I'm going to go be the greatest disciple that ever lived. I'm going to make Paul look like he was nothing. Well, you can do that, but you're going to really, really, really do a bad job. Because really, in effect, what you're saying is, I'm going to do it. Well, you can't. But the Holy Spirit living in you can and my job is to teach you to be completely, holy, totally, completely surrendered to the work of the Spirit in your life. I want everyone to turn to Philippians chapter 2 as I get ready to close this message. Philippians chapter 2. Because the Lord gives us the key to living this life of a disciple. So when you gave your life to the Lord, something very magical happened. When you believed in Jesus, that first list of requirements today, the Holy Spirit began to live in you. And here's what happens when that happens. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And he gave you the will and the power to do of his good pleasure, which is discipleship. He now lives in you to call you to that deeper life and to meet these seven requirements. And so the simple one application today is look at that list, take it seriously. You can get this on the app, you can get it on the, on the, on the website by looking at this teaching. Get this list and just search it over with the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, point out anything you need me to do in any of these areas. And by the way, none of us have them down remotely close to done. We're supposed to be growing in all seven of these. And we're supposed to get better and better at doing it. So that's the challenge today. The application is take these seven calls to discipleship and take them more seriously every day, more seriously than the day before. But in doing that, Philippians chapter 2, 13, don't think you can do it. When you tell the Lord every morning, Lord, I can't do this life, and that's why I need to kill my flesh. But I, if you live in me and you overwhelm me, and you fill me with your spirit, you can do it like crazy. You can be a great disciple living in and through me for me. I can't live this life you call me to live. So a total and utter dependence on the Holy Spirit will give you all the power to do what he's called you to do. In fact, he'll give you the will and the power to do of his good pleasure. So today, a simple challenge. Look at the requirements of discipleship and say, Lord, I want that because that's the blessed life. Give me your will, your wisdom, your power. And oh boy, oh boy, does he want to do that more than you want him to do that for you. So trust him to do that in your life. Today, the call to discipleship. It's a radical high bar. And I say, thank you, Lord, because that is the greatest, most blessed life to be had. Let's close in prayer. Father, I know in a room like this, some of us may feel convicted today may feel totally overwhelmed. I'm a horrible disciple, we may be thinking. But Lord, that's not what you do. You're just simply calling us today to more discipleship. And it's about progress. It's not about where we are, it's about progress. You want us to go into deeper, more committed discipleship. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless us by helping us realize we can't live this life of a disciple, but you can in and through us. And the better job we do of these things, loving you more than our family, loving you more than our lives, counting the cost, saying no to ourselves, abiding in your word, abiding in you, your word abiding in us, the better we do at that, we just submit to you and you do that work. We want to do that work like crazy, but it's your Holy Spirit that's going to give us the will and the power to do it. So please, Lord, do it. Do that work in us as we submit and surrender to the work of your spirit. All we can give to you is our will, and you'll give us everything that's needed, everything, and then we'll want to do it. So thank you, Lord, for calling us into a deeper and a more robust life of discipleship. It is the blessed life, and Jesus proved it because he was the perfect disciple, if you will. 
Thank you, Lord, today and challenge us, continue to call us, that we can be salt and light that really brings flavor into this world. And we ask and thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.